Suppose, suppose I were to ask you to name a life-saving medical technology. What would you name? Maybe you would name a pacemaker or a defibrillator or some other electromechanical device. And these are life-saving medical technologies, but there are others. Maybe you would name something high-tech, like 3D printing or stem cells. And these are life-saving medical technologies, but there are others. Maybe you wouldn't think about silk or seaweed or corn or soy as life-saving medical technologies, but these are life-saving innovations. Now suppose I were to ask you to describe a life-saving medical innovator. Maybe you would name a surgeon or a medical researcher. And these are life-saving medical innovators, but there are others. I remember my very first science project. It was in fourth grade. My teacher asked us to collect and classify leaves. And I loved this project. It was what really got me into science. I loved the branching patterns of the veins on the leaves. And I loved the beauty and the wonder of nature. And this led me to my next love, which was the human body. Because our body, too, has beautiful, symmetric, branching structures. And at the time, as a fourth grader, as a fifth grader, it seemed natural to me that these two areas would be connected. But somehow, when we advance beyond childhood, we forget about these connections, and we become subspecialized. And in fact, when I went to college, I became pretty specialized. I studied chemical engineering. But here's the thing. The most important things I learned as an engineering student were not the specifics of thermodynamics and fluid mechanics. The most important things that I learned were that our assumptions about physical systems were very, very important. In fact, the assumptions that we make completely define our approach to solving problems. For example, if we think about the branching blood vessels and we try to model blood flow in those vessels, we could get caught up in details really quickly. We could start thinking about how red blood cells interact with each other or the different eddy currents within the vessels. And it would quickly become an unsolvable problem. But if we focus on the essentials, if we say, well, I'm going to assume that blood is an ideal fluid, and I'm going to assume that the blood vessel is a rigid tube, then all of a sudden, I have a solvable problem, and I've captured the essentials of the system. It's just like learning to drive, right? I mean, you can't be in the Indy 500 before you learn to steer the wheel. So I learned in college that I needed to define my assumptions and capture the essential characteristics of the system. Now, after all of my educational training, my first real-world job was at the DuPont Company. And the first problem that my team had to attack, again, had to do with blood. It had to do with, how do I stop blood flow from someone who has a wound? And we tried all kinds of different approaches. We tried this rigid industrial polymer, and it caused injury and inflammation to the tissues. We tried a fixative polymer, another industrial material, and again, it injured the tissues, caused burning. So then we decided to try a natural material. We tried a starch, 
and it worked beautifully. It was soft and flexible, just like the tissues of the human body. It could absorb water. It worked wonderfully. And this experience at DuPont taught me to redefine my assumptions about what innovation looks like. Is innovation new ideas? Well, sure it is. But the most impactful innovations are actually combinations of new ideas and old ideas. I mean, think about it. Natural materials as medical materials make a lot of sense. The Egyptians were the first to use implantable medical materials, and they used silk sutures. So this is intuitive. And so if we combine powerful new ideas with powerful old ideas, then we have new combinations which lead to a new reality through innovation. So I had learned that I had to redefine my assumptions about what medical innovations look like. But it wasn't until I started teaching students at Harvard that I learned to redefine my assumptions about what medical innovators look like. The very first student who approached me when I began teaching at Harvard in 2011 was a young woman named Mareji Fatunde. Mareji was from Nigeria, and she was very interested in medical innovations for low and middle income countries. And she said, I heard that you work on natural materials, Sujata. I want to work with you on a senior thesis. Well, Mareji completed a beautiful senior thesis where she evaluated an array of natural materials that were abundant in low and middle income countries for medical applications, such as corneal bandages or corneal regeneration. Mareji, based on her experiences, realized that natural materials could be an avenue for low and middle income countries to enter the biomedical revolution. She showed that fibers derived from soy were actually very compatible with corneal cells of the eye. Mareji's success taught me that our youngest students can actually be our best innovators. And I redefined my assumptions about who can be an innovator. Mareji's success led me to form connections with the Harvard Kennedy School of Government led me to speak to innovators and work with innovators in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Mauritius, in Slovenia, and now to TEDxUNC. And her success was quickly followed by that of a couple other students. Why are our youngest students our best innovators? Well, they have heart, <coughs> they have courage. They don't realize that anything is impossible, so everything is possible. And they don't see traditional disciplinary boundaries. So my next student was Leslie Ray. And Leslie worked on corn-derived materials for patches for the heart, for patients in heart failure. And Leslie, who was a member of the women's swimming and diving team at Harvard, showed that these nanofiber mats made of corn-derived polymers were actually very compatible with cardiac cells. Again, someone you might not think of traditionally as a medical innovator. Leslie was followed by Vincent. Vincent worked on materials derived from seaweed called alginate polymers. And he showed that these alginate polymers could be formed into microspheres that could be used for controlled release of important therapeutics, such as chemotherapeutics. So these students have shown me a new truth about what medical innovators can look like. And they've shown me the real importance of diversity and innovation, because these students each leveraged their own experiences. They worked from their own experiences to identify unmet needs and then find innovative solutions. So we don't just need thinkers, we need diverse thinkers 
We need women. We need individuals from diverse cultural backgrounds. We need innovators of all sizes and shapes. So I am a physician, I am an advisor, I am a teacher, but at heart, I'm an engineer. And now I want to talk about applying these assumptions to solving problems in education. If we choose to redefine our assumptions about what a medical innovation can look like and what an innovator can look like, this leads us to a better educational reality. We need to have an engineering education reality where we empower our students to identify unmet needs, where teachers provide one-on-one -on -one mentoring and enable students to work on open-ended problems because real-world challenges don't present themselves as homework sets with a solutions manual. We need to provide opportunities for students to work on hands-on projects early in their education. And we need to give credence and value to every student and every idea. And ultimately, as educators, we need to protect our seed corn. What that means is we need to put the best teachers in front of the youngest students. This is the only way these students are going to be empowered to leverage their own experience, to identify unmet needs, and solve these open-ended problems. We need to recognize that if we engage and recruit and retain students to be innovators, if we redefine our assumptions about what innovation and innovators can look like, then we will reach new altitudes in diversity, in achievement, in fulfillment, and ultimately in innovation. Because this is the only way that we're going to find that next life-saving, life-giving medical technology. Thank you.